Congratulations, guys. Um, this is easily my favourite film of 2023. Oh, come on. Yeah. Come on. And I'm not just saying that because I'm talking to you. It is absolutely phenomenal. I can't I can't speak highly about this film enough. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Congratulations. So we wanted to start. Um, did either of you watch the short film before you, you got on this project? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, before I, I read the script and, and then watched the short and then I, I met Sam and Ping. So I, I watched it and was like, whoa. Like yeah. It was, also, it's. I mean, the look of it. James Rhodes did both the short and and um, the feature. It was just. It was incredible. Incredible. Yeah, I was totally the same. Just like knocked over by the short, and uh, yeah, we're so so excited. The prospect to get to talk to Sam and Ping, you know, following that and the script. Amazing, and it, it is really good and so nuanced, and the characters are really great. So I want to start with you, Nathan, about getting into Jules and kind of his like psychology during the film. Um, it, it was very quick. It was a, it was a quick turnaround, but I, I I felt like I had an in. I felt like it was just you know I had a beginning. The script is so so detailed, so I just went through. And then what I did is I, I kind of decided that where the film starts is where Jules is the kind of like the happiest. Like he's almost like in his life or in the last few years. There was a culmination of several things, and so that when Jules is there on stage as Aphrodite, it's a real culmination of something. And when he meets Preston, that's like then the film starts. And I thought kind of that having that fall, having that descent emotionally at the beginning of the film would set me up to to run. And then it was all it was all the physical, all the physical stuff, um, the learning to walk and heal, the nails and the hair and the lip gloss, which hair sticks on. Um, it was it was all of that, and it really I let that inform me. So it was a lot of times actors. You know, we go from the inside out, we work with how we're feeling and we go out and we, we perform, we do our thing. And I really wanted um, Jules's costume and, and and Aphrodite to really inform me. And I thought, well, this this is a person who puts on clothes and then builds into that. And I wanted to be like that. So that's kind of where we started. There was lots of rummaging through Bookie and the costume designer. I think I did, George, you do know this. I basically just walk through the costume. We'd be like, I like that, I like that. Yeah. And then she'd yeah. be like, well, that's for George. I was like, not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> just kind of steal things. But also, like, just to add context, this costume room was like huge, unbelievable, huge. like an entire room of just rails and rails and rails of the most fabulous clothes you can imagine. She like shipped it all. It was even amazing. Yeah. But it really was. I was building. I was building at that point in time. So that's that's kind of quite an abridged version of it, maybe. But like that's kind of what I was doing. Because what I find fascinating, because you almost play three characters, I guess. You play like yeah. Jules, Aphrodite, and then Jules with Preston and his friends as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and really had to, I mean, when Jules goes to the sauna, they kind of like build up them, the strength to go to the sauna. We were like, this is going to be high femme. That's why we went for a crop top and like, you know, the thong. Like it was just the whale wailing. It, we really kind of went somewhere. And like those decisions were really, really specific. And then when Jules like, is going to get Preston. We were like, well, what would Preston be into? What would he respect? And like, that's why you've got all like, the shopping and the clothes and whatever. So it was so many different things and it had to inform like, what do I want, to, what did, sorry, Jules want to present or what was coming out? It really had to kind of inform it, which is incredible to kind of, it's like free, free money, isn't it? It's like, yeah, because just you're not really thinking or letting things think for you. Amazing. And it's so well done. Um, and incredibly as well, George Preston could have easily been a sort of stereotypical straight blokey esque man and this facade, but you play him with such a level of like nuance and characterization and there's a tenderness to him that I really loved. I just wanted to talk about getting into Preston and his makeup. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I mean, he's he's a sort of dream of a role. They, they both are really. Um, so it was just a pleasure to sort of dig in and get to know him like so we we did you know Sam and I spoke about kind of the man he was up until that point the experiences that make him like you know in terms of the relationships he's had his sexual experience like the nuggets that you get throughout the script in terms of like his time in prison like what was it like how you know you're with these characters they're always sort of presenting a version of themselves so you kind of then have to sort of almost fact check that like okay like what did he go in for and like and what was what was the experience like in there you know because I always think that scene's quite telling me like, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> and it was like, oh, wow. So something happened there. Um, and then again, equivalently to to Nathan or to, to Jules, the, the, the drag, like Preston's drag was so 
fundamental to who he was um and uh and so that was working with bookie our costume designer and marie our um hair and makeup designer and just sort of you know making a sort of a nuanced sense of like these kind of almost hidden messages within that so i felt very sort of true in the things that we put on on his body so the tattoos were a big thing too and we kind of like almost had sort of hidden messages like the sleeve here we knew we wanted a sleeve but within that sleeve there's almost kind of coded messages of this from more feminine side then we had more sort of almost like the phases that he would have gone through like the kind of the big lion there and um and it's a sort of map of like you know he's kind of decorated himself and i think preston's someone that because he is not comfortable with the truth of who he is he kind of has continually over time i always imagine changed i think he would have gone through different styles he would have had different haircuts different fashion sort of uh moments and also he's into fashion too so it was um yeah it was kind of basically just building a backstory and then and then and then sort of harnessing this amazing sort of costume box basically this entire room to to add on to that and to sort of say and like the same with Jules is like what does he want to say with this like he's a very conscious about what he what armor what impression he wants to make like am I the businessman so what's sorry white in that club all yeah yeah white. yeah like like all of all of that like what 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 is each outfit saying like what do I want to put across because they talk through their clothes you know they talk through their appearance um and then and then so much of the kind of wonderful nuance is also just in the writing as well it's such a beautifully written script um i've got sam and ping to think about amazing incredible i was going to say because my favorite one is the silk red shirt that he wears going to the performance in yeah well, we, on we a thought birthday like, we we had a couple of options we had like a sort of really like you know fake versace number with all these gold chains on it and we thought no there's got to be something like earnest like he's really he's met he's put a shirt on like he's put he's put a collar on um, and it's got that kind of that silky flavor that's kind of Preston. It's a bit, it's a bit Preston, but it's also like a genuine attempt to like dress nice. And we also sort of spoke about his background of that sort of quite traditional, like when you go to a birthday party, you you put your best clothes on, you know, like you so and there's and I think within that there's a sort of sweetness. Um, so uh yeah, I like that red shirt too. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and speaking about costumes, because I, I mean, I could spend hours talking about your costuming, both of you here. But I just I want to talk more about um, Nathan getting into drag culture and the lip syncing um, for Aphrodite and how that was, because that first opening sequence blew my mind. I was like, oh, my oh. God, I would go and watch Aphrodite like, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I just, I just learned the song on repeat. I was listening to that song all the time. And um, you know, we didn't have very long, um, really, like a lot of prep time. So it was soon as it was like, okay, it's a go. I literally, I was like, let's play the song. And it was, it kind of trying to embody it as well. I was trying to work out how to embody that song. It was, um, I have like an emotional connection to it. So that was, that was the first thing I just, I really put it on. And then I looked at, you know, I looked at um, Drag Race and I looked at Drag Queens um, a lot and just tried to find out about a kind of like the cadence of it. But then really I was like, actually looking at Drag Queens, you don't want to look at derivative or something. I was like, let's go back to the source. So I would call them the divas and, you know, like they would look at Nicki Minaj, you know, I mean, Campbell, you know, look at like certain people, obviously looked at Beyonce. There were just certain things with the Chun-Li and anime as well that I wanted to inform. And again, we go back to costume. I was like, this, how do we, with the second performance, what do we do with the hair? How is this? I was this part of Jules and, and Jules' creativity and expression. So there was a lot of looking and watching. And then what's great with that stuff is that it just all of it informs you. So I I don't I didn't know what to do with the, you know, my nails or whatever um, on my phone, but I couldn't do what I would normally do. So then I started doing stuff that was just so in that world but it was because I couldn't do anything else. You know, I just couldn't bend down because it was like hair was going to room and cover like a curtain. So it was just really like, this is the way you have to move in this, this costume. And that was kind of, in a way it's li liberating because you're like, well, I, I just have to do this. This is how I have to embody this. It was, it was great. But no, I looked at a lot of, um, I looked at a lot of the divas and I kind of, I had fun watching like catwalk shows and like, watching like Nicki Minaj's like um, radio interviews and like her just talking and just really like how, letting it seep in, like just letting it come in and seeing what comes out on the day. And then the day was, I mean, Georgie were there. It was just kind of, 
I was so nervous. I think the Aphrodite day, like Ping, uh, Ping twisted his ankle through leaping yeah. the monitor. He was so excited. <laughs> we were all backstage and I was watching it on the monitor like, oh my God, this is amazing. And it, Ping, there was like one time when the perfect, you know, the steady cam shot came around perfectly and Ping just jumped up. And then for the next <laughs> two weeks, he was on crutches. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot. It was just like, because all of the, the in-between moments when we were doing the song, but the stuff that was like improvised, we didn't have that long to like, it wasn't all choreographed and stuff. So I was just like tottering around, like trying to make it work, which I feel like is very in the world of, of drag queens. Like, you know, I think I've said before, like a lot of drag queens are like in clubs, in pubs, in the sound isn't good and the light isn't good or a heel breaks or someone gets drunk and like throws themselves in them, and they just make these performances work. You just kind of trust, embody, and believe it because you have to do it. And I think there was a part, an element of that where I was like, well, we, have we done dance enough and whatever? And you're like, you've just got to literally, as, as a drag queen, say, sir, that's all. And so I had to throw myself into that and, and enjoy it. And again, it was liberating. I was like, well, up here right now, I can do no wrong because I, you know, it's my room. And, and that was really, that was, it was kind of incredible. So um, that was the prep for that. Like, it was good. And I, I walked, I, I didn't, didn't fall. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Um, one of the other things that I find remarkable about this film is how the story is also told throughout your sex scenes and how that evolves from like a kind of cold, like almost aggressive uh, first sex scene and then becomes more tender across the film. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about coordinating together and with the intimacy coordinator and how, how you were telling the story through those sequences. Well, I'm just, I'm really glad that Sarah, that's like really cool because it's so... Uh... It's so nice that I was like, you can see that, and that's really cool. Um, it's, it's just as you said it, really, because uh, Robbie Taylor Hunt really provided the space for that and and was very clear about the scenes being part of the narrative and having an, an arc within themselves and and all of us like agreeing that because the sex was a tool that it needed to be specific in those moments and have a, you know, Robbie would talk about quality of something and, and, and kind of like, you know, talk in terms of like almost like physics and like, you know, this is like a liquid here and whatever there. Well, maybe not the best couple. <laughs> so really, we really discussed it and kind of like nailed down. <laughs> nailed down. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> you're in like, you're in like a pun minefield here. Now we like doing yeah. something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. <Continue. what. laughs> Thank you. Exactly what those scenes meant. And because he gave us those parameters and because we knew it meant that within that we could we could really go anywhere and tell that story. They were very, very specific. George did say something, because come on. No, no, no. You've said it, you've said it all. I think. No, but you know, I'm gonna see I'm gonna start speaking in Induendo all the whole no, time. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think of some puns yeah. now, but um no, 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 but like it's, it's as Nathan said, and, and again, it's really cool that. Sort of you picked you picked up on it because it's essential to the storytelling. You know, it's it's a storytelling device. It's it's a real them. It's this kind of like milestones within their relationship as the points where like, okay, you want me to be this kind of person. All right, fine. You, I'll give you that kind of person. Oh wow, now you're making me feel this. Like I've never done this like this before, and now it can never be the same again. You know, it's all of, um, yeah, the 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 sort of fundamental. Uh, sort of milestones within their relationship are, are kind of often within within the way they have sex so um they were all very um carefully thought through um as as story storytelling devices so yeah incredible and you guys must have so much trust in each other as well because you have those also the violent scenes together as well so yeah. like um how was it working coordinating those scenes um in that kind of mirror of the two bookends of the film well there's one thing actually without giving a way to, you know, to folk who haven't seen the film, but that, you know, there is one particular, like there's a fight scene where, and, and, and we were sort of wanted to sort of have the set, the sexual relationship they've had mirrored in the sort of positions that they take within the fight. So there's all these kind of through lines of kind of patterns of storytelling within it. And I mean, we just like, it's a similarly intimate and sensitive thing. I mean, Nathan often spoke about like the kind of, where you have to be very safe and controlled and trusting is it that your body is telling you to do obviously we're never actually hitting each other but your body is like you're being put in those situations and so you have to be so kind of respectful of the boundaries and, and, and united in what those boundaries are so to be able to kind of go the lengths that you need to go for the scene without anyone sort of feeling unsafe or compromised or, or literally hurt so um 
yeah, it was kind of similarly the the violence in the film is again vital to the storytelling and the story. So we it was planned and choreographed as carefully as as the sex and every other aspect of the writing. And they're, they're, you know, the opposite ends of the same same scale in that sense. Amazing. Well, that's all I have time for today. Um, thank you so much for spending time and talking to me about this phenomenal film. I can't wait for people to watch it. It's truly remarkable. And you did a, such a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey, hey you guys. <laughs> hey, you guys. Hey, hey, hey. That's what they all say. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys.